Hello, everybody. I would like to start by thanking the organizers uh, for this invitation and for the opportunity to present some of my group's efforts to develop stem cell derived pacemakers as a promising future for cardiac pacing. And I want to start off with my disclosure slide. And then let's start off by um, talking about how the heartbeat is regulated under physiological conditions. It's regulated by the cardiac conduction system that is highlighted here in yellow. And that conduction system both initiates the heartbeat and conducts electric signals. And the key players are the primary pacemaker, the SA node, that's on top of the right atria that initiates the heartbeat. And then this electric signal travels over the atria to the secondary pacemaker, the AV node, which is the single electric connection between the atria and the ventricles. And from there, the electric activity travels through the bundle branches to the bottom of the heart where Purkinje fibers initiate contraction of the ventricles. And all of these cell types of the conduction system can be impacted by different diseases, such as sinus syndrome, AV block, or bundle branch block. And all of them have in common that uh, they result in a too slow or irregular heartbeat. And uh, for patients, it means symptoms uh, from just feeling fatigued, but all the way to syncope. And the current standard treatment is the implantation of an electronic pacemaker device that consists of a battery pack and two leads that take over the electric activation of the atria and the ventricles. There's about 21,000 electronic pacemakers implanted per year in Canada. And if you look over to Europe, it's half a million per year. So you can see it's a quite large patient population. And these electronic pacemakers are great for these patients because they are lifesavers. However, they also come with a couple of uh, disadvantages. For example, a relatively high complication rate due to infection and dislocation of the pacemaker leads. The electric device cannot communicate with the autonomic nervous system. It's battery driven, as I mentioned, and these batteries need to be replaced by a surgery every five to 10 years. If you think of pediatric patients, they um, have a small heart when this pacemaker is uh, implanted, and while the heart grows, the leads cannot really adjust the growth of the heart. So these uh, children have to undergo recurrent surgeries, which further uh, increases their risk for complications. And most relevant for the symposium, I think, is that now a couple of clinical trials have shown that electronic pacemakers can induce heart failure. And that is because um, the ventricles are stimulated from this right side here which is one-sided instead of the synchronous contraction of the heart as you saw in the animation through the conduction system. And that leads to remodeling and eventually to heart failure. You might also be aware that this has been addressed by adding a third pacing lead into the left ventricle, which now allows to synchronously activate contraction of the right ventricle and left ventricle in what we call cardiac resynchronization therapy. And this is actually used in a subset of heart failure patients that have reduced ejection fraction and bundle branch block to slow the progression of heart failure. However, this therapy still comes with the other disadvantages of an electronic pacemaker, such as high complication risks and also the need for battery replacement. And that is really why I believe that a regenerative medicine approach is the idea to replace damaged part of the conduction system with new functional cells basically the generation of biological pacemakers could really be advantageous here and could overcome these issues of electronic pacemakers. And one question now uh, that then comes out of this is what is the source of these new functional cells? How can we generate them? And that is uh, where my team and many people in the world believe that human pluripotent stem cells are a great source uh, to make those cell types because they can differentiate into any cell type of the body. What I'm going to focus on for today's presentation is my team's effort to uh, differentiate those human pluripotent stem cells into AV node like cells with the goal to eventually use them as a biological pacemaker that can bridge to the conduction between the atria and the ventricles for patients with AV block. And uh, if you want to differentiate those stem cells into uh, AV node cells, we uh, do that by following key steps of her development that we've learned from studying model organisms. So let me share with you those key steps of heart development and how we, we and many labs in the world use that to differentiate cardiomyocytes from stem cells. So heart cells are specified initially at the primitive streak where mesoderm is specified and those cardiac progenitors or mesoderm, cardiogenic mesoderm then migrates to form a cardiac crescent that fuses to form a heart tube that uh, basically results in the first heartbeat that can be detected in the mouse around E9 and in the human around day 20. 
And then the thread tube undergoes these complicated processes called ballooning and looping to form this typical four chambered herd as we know it with two atrias and uh, the ventricles uh, below. And that is completed around E14 in the mouse and day 50 in the human. And at that point, most of the cell types are actually being specified developmentally and they just continue to mature until after birth. And we are recapitulating these key steps in the petri dish with our human embryonic stem cells. And uh, in my group, we are using an embryo body approach, so we are aggregating them and exposing these aggregates to the signals that are present at the primitive state, which are beam people and activator signaling to specify cardiogenic mesoderm. And that further gets specified to cardiac progenitors with a Vince inhibition step. And around the eight in culture, we have these cardiac progenitors that are starting to contract and are correlating to the heart tube stage. And we routinely keep those cultures till around day 20, where we know that they're reflecting um, the E14 mouse heart. And we can monitor these cultures very easily by just looking through the microscope and we can see our nice uh, contractile amploid bodies. But obviously we're also using more uh, quantitative approaches, which is flow cytometry, where we can look for cardiac specific contractile apparatus proteins such as troponin T here. And you can see we can pretty efficiently generate cardiomyocytes with up to 95% in the petri dish. But the big question becomes what types of cardiomyocytes are we actually generating? And the answer is we're generating a mix of all these step types that are present in the heart, but the majority have a ventricular like phenotype. So, really, a big challenge in the field over the past years has been to specifically generate different uh, myocyte subtypes. And that's something that has been addressed by a couple of labs throughout the world. And uh, I have been working on during my postdoctoral fellowship in Dr. Gordon Keller's lab. And so we are now actually able to generate really enriched cultures of ventricular cells or atrial myocyte and also primary pacemaker cells. And one of the interesting key findings uh, we had during my postdoctoral fellowship was that this lineage segregation already happens very early on during development, which was initially not expected. Already at the mesoderm stage, we're segregating between an atrial and a ventricular phenotype. And that has also been shown in in vivo studies by a single clonal um, lineage tracing in the mouse from labs like uh, Cedric Lampain and Ben Cornell. So what we specifically found in our human in vitro system was when we used high concentrations of active A to induce our cardiogenic mesoderm, we generate a progenitor that expresses CD235A and very efficiently gives rise to ventricular myocyte. If we use low concentrations of active A, we are infusing a different kind of cardiogenic mesoderm that does not express CD235A, but expresses RALDH2. And some of you may know RALDH2 is the key enzyme to convert retinol to retinoic acid. And retinoic acid is an important key signal for specifying atrial myocyte. So this way we can specify atrial myocyte. And from the same mesoderm by modifying additional signaling pathway, we were also able to show that we can generate SA node pacemaker cells. What is not really known yet is how to uh, differentiate AV node cells from pluripotent stem cells. And that's a project we started uh, in my lab with my first graduate student, Michelle Lowbeeler. And the way we started out in this project was by simply asking, do we actually have AV node cells in our mixed cardiomyocyte cultures? And for that, we use single cell RNA sequencing in collaboration with Gary Bader from U of T. And uh, what we found is that there was a small population of AV node-like cells that expressed myocyte markers, such as troponin and NKX 2.5 but also AV node markers like TBX2 and TBX3. So that uh, motivated us to uh, go ahead and generate a double reporter line, which has a GFP reporter knocked into one allele of the NKX2.5 cardiac transcription factor and a tomato reporter into an uh, allele of the TBX3 um, cardiac transcription factor, which is pacemaker specific. So that allows us to identify double positive AV node-like cells and distinguish them from um, NKX2.5 negative as A node cells, which we know lack this NKX expression. But it also allows us to distinguish it from working cardiomyocytes, which is atrial ventricular cells, because they do not express this pacemaker marker TBX3. So when we use this new reporter line, this is our standard differentiation approach, what we find is that the majority of the cells are NKX2.5 positive myocytes. And then there's this really small population of cells that also express TBX3. And the question is, do these cells have an AV node-like phenotype? And to answer this question, we sorted them out by facts and analyzed them by qPCR. So I'm showing you on this slide are the violin plots of this molecular analysis. And we're seeing in purple the double positive cells. In gray, the single positive cells that were separated from the same differentiation. 
And in order to have some reference expression patterns, we also generated as anode cells in red, atrial myocytes in green, and ventricular myocytes in blue um, during these differentiations from the same reporter line. What we find is that there's, as expected, significant lower levels of NKX2.5 in pacemaker cells where all the other myocytes express that marker. If we look for pacemaker markers, we can see they are enriched in this um, double positive purple population here compared to working myocytes. Importantly, when we look for AV node markers like TBX2, MSX2, and BMP2, they seem specifically enriched in this double positive population. We also check for as anode markers, such as SHOX2, which is only expressed in this anode population and not really enriched in this double positive population. And when we look for atrial markers and ventricular markers, we find they're specifically enriched in atrial myocytes and uh, ventricular myocytes, respectively. It really um, allows us to conclude that it looks like that we can use this double positive selection um, criteria to uh, isolate AV node-like cells. So now we have a handle on identifying these cells and isolating them. And the big question is how can we developmentally specify them? How can we make more of these cells? And we started that by asking what mesoderm do these cells uh, derive from? Because I told you at the beginning that mesoderm seems to be very important. And uh, so we first um, tried to make them from our CD235 positive mesoderm using high activin. And that is when we obtain these cultures with a small proportion of double positive cells. When we are generating mesoderm that's well DH2 positive, we're using our low activin induction up here. You can see that we can increase this proportion of double positive cells. And what was really interesting to us was when we used intermediate concentrations of activin, we were able to significantly increase this double positive population. And this progenitor that we specified didn't express any of our known markers, which looks like that AV node cells might actually develop from a completely distinct mesoderm, which developmentally and conceptually makes sense. And this is something we're currently following up to try and further increase um, this population. But with that, I wanna move on um, to the last part of my presentation where I wanna share with you a little bit how we now started testing the functional ability of these AV node-like cells to function as a biological pacemaker, um, specifically as a conduction switch. The first thing we did was actually checking for the pacemaker phenotype, because after all, the AV node is the secondary pacemaker of the heart. So these cells should have pacemaker phenotype. And for that, we used patch clamp analysis in collaboration with uh, the Baxlab from York University. And um, we can see that the double positive cells had typical pacemaker action potentials here on the left, while our um, control cells that are NKX2.5 single positive ventricular cells have typical ventricular action potential. And you can judge that, for example, based on the upstroke velocity, which is much slower in pacemaker cells than in uh, ventricular cells. Uh, with that, we could also read out beating rates, obviously, and the, um, the um, AV node cells beat about 60 beats per minute and beat faster than our ventricular control cells. And that beating rate is actually comparable to the spontaneous rhythm of the human AV node. So then we moved on and analyzed the conduction properties of these cells. And that is because in vivo, the AV node has two key important conduction properties. The first one is to delay the electric stimulation between the atria and the ventricles. And that is really to allow complete blood filling of the ventricles. And that is achieved by a slow conduction in the AV node versus very fast conduction in the atrial ventricular chambers. The second important function is to prevent the conduction of fast atrial rhythms, such as atrial fibrillation, to the ventricular chambers, because if they would conduct through the AV node, then that would be um, definitely very life threatening. So how did we do this? We generated 3D tissues in collaboration with the Vasconcelos lab at UHN, either containing AV node cells or ventricular cells. And then we used optical mapping in collaboration with Santa Cruz lab at UHN, where we paste the tissues from the top and then measured how long the conduction takes at the bottom. And that's in this picture, as you can see, color coded takes about 100 milliseconds for our AV node tissues. While on the same color scale, uh, the ventricular tissues appear completely purple because it only takes 10 milliseconds to conduct a signal. And the conduction velocities we calculated for these AV node tissues were actually very comparable to a human AV node conduction. We used the same setup to also test the second important function of the AV node to block the conduction of atrial arrhythmias. And we did that by pasting the tissues on top and analyzing how fast they would follow at the bottom. And what you see here is the stimulation frequency of that is increasing on the x-axis and the capture ratio of these tissues on the bottom on the y-axis. And when we do this with ventricular tissues, as you see here in blue, 
Um, we pace them up to 10 hertz, they follow in a one-to-one -one capture ratio, which means the ventricles would follow at 10 hertz if the atria would fibrillate that fast. Importantly, our AV node tissues already lost this one-to-one -one capture when we stimulated them at 3.5 hertz. And by the time we stimulated them at 10 hertz, they had gone into a three-to-one clock, resulting in pacing of the ventricles of only three hertz. So that really showed us that uh, preliminary data that the AV node tissues have this AV node-like conduction properties, which is really exciting to us. It also emphasizes that it's important to use the right cell type for cell therapy approaches because ventricular cells clearly uh, wouldn't have the same properties as I hopefully convinced you here. And with that, I'm gonna finish by just showing you where we're taking this next in collaboration with Michael Flam here at UHN. We're gonna actually test those tissues now in vivo in a guinea pig model. We're gonna use them to bridge the atria and the ventricles. And after two weeks, we're gonna analyze the hertz ex vivo using optical mapping and ECG recordings. And we're gonna block the guinea pig's endogenous AV node with an acute AV plot to then analyze the conduction over these tissues and actually really show that they can function as a bridge in vivo. And with that, I wanna finish by thanking all the people who are involved in this work and our funding sources. And of course, all the members of my team, you see a recent Zoom lab photo here on the left side. And you can see we're a very happy team, everybody's smiling. Um, but we're also pretty small still, uh, because we only started about two years ago. So we're actually currently hiring postdoctoral fellows. So if you're interested in joining our team in Toronto, then please send me a note. Thank you, everybody. I'm happy to take any questions.